who holds a master's degree in sociology from the University of Quebec in Montreal, where he focused on the work of human rights defenders in Central America. He drew on his experience from living in Honduras and Guatemala, working as an international accompanying and human rights observer. Joining us right beside him, we have Tito Medina, born in Guatemala in 1957. He's a singer-songwriter and an icon for Guatemalan revolutionary music. His voice and musical work started to emerge during national protests in the early 1970s on the streets of Guatemala City. And he's also very close friends with Rigoberto, so thanks for joining us. And then farthest, farthest to the right, we have Rachel Vincent, and she is the advocacy coordinator for the Nobel Women's Initiative. She focuses on indigenous issues in Mexico, Honduras, and Guatemala. She started her career as a radio journalist, uh, working in Canada, Mexico, and the US. Thanks for joining us. Um, Tito, I might start with you. You know Rigoberto very well. Tell me a bit about how you saw things unfold and what you thought about the film. If there is a continuum, I would like to say that uh, this story, for my side, I would say it started when I was 13 years old, getting into one of the normal schools to become a teacher, and finding the other reality in my own country that reflects uh, 500 years of oppression, you know, a persecution against the indigenous peoples. And being a Maya Mestizo myself, you know, uh, sometimes it's like having uh, the access to the two sides of the coin. The one that is uh, racist and has a lot of power and access to the other side that don't, don't have more than the spirit, you know, and this need to stay in balance with life, wherever it comes. And in this situation, it's very important when Rigoberta mentioned, you know, the small town where she comes. Because even today, there is no access to water and electricity in the surrounding areas. And yesterday, one of the members of the one of the organization, the Comité de Unidad Campesina Coup, was sent to jail. And is a political prisoner in Guatemala. Which means that the situation hasn't changed. There are many women that has been, you know, portrayed really badly in the Guatemalan press, despite they have been doing a lot to make a greater society. And uh, this is very important for us, because being a Nobel Peace Prize doesn't mean that you are going to change the patterns, you know, of division, oppression, you know, and self-repression as well. And in Guatemala still is one of the countries that were Discrimination exists not like a, a norm. It's something the standard. It's one of the most violent countries in the world. And we need to reverse that, but with love, with passion, and knowing that the, despite what happened with our families, despite the torture we, we suffer, or our parents or our friends have suffered, you know, if we can keep loving and building a society that is like a dream that can speak with the flowers, with the mountains, with the power, with the rivers. And we can connect each other at the basic level, you know, of love, you know, and as well, you know, recognizing the wisdom, the legacy of our ancestors, but knowing that the ones who, who are not yet born are going to be proud about the legacy that we have been building in over 10,000 years of culture. And that's why for me it's so, so nice to, to know that Rigoberta has been, you know, uh, working her life with that kind of commitment, with that kind of passion, because she's a very single woman that is so easy to, for her to cry, but she is as well so easy to smile. Mm -hmm. you know? And I don't know, I don't want to take too much of the time now, but we need to, you know, there's a, a great life, and I'm so honored, you know, to, to tell you that uh, there are many Rigobertas, not just in Guatemala, but in every single small village in this planet. Um, Rachel, you had mentioned earlier that this is your first time seeing the film. What are your thoughts? What stood out to you? Uh, well, I enjoyed it. I think it really packs in, in 60 minutes, a lot of history. You know, we joke when you work in Latin America that everything goes back to the conquest, and this film literally starts at the conquest. So it's, it's great because I think it takes us rapidly through a, a lot of, of history. 
Uh, and Rigoberta has been a key player in, in the last 40 years of that country's history. I'm lucky enough to know Rigoberta as well. Um, the Nobel Women's Initiative works with Rigoberta. She's a board member of our organization. And in fact, I was in Guatemala most recently with her for the trial of Sepper Zarco. Um, so I was glad that Yvonne and Dawn, who uh, did the film, were able to bring us up to that piece of, of the history. And I think what's interesting is Rigoberta has um, not been given her due globally for the work that she's done on justice. If you spend time with Rigoberta, she is as knowledgeable, if not more so, than any lawyer I've ever met international lawyer I've met in terms of international law. She's remarkable, and that case, the Spanish Embassy case, that um, really brought finally some justice um, in the case of her dad and the other people who had died in the Spanish Embassy, not only helped vindicate her own story because she had been attacked for lying, um, but I think also paved the way for some of those other key justice cases in Guatemala, which are quite unique in the region. So I, I, I'm really happy to finally see, see Rigoberta through this film, and I think through some other recent um, work, really finally get her due. Um, Guillaume, it wasn't long ago that Canadians saw Ida Lamour flare up, where indigenous issues kind of became at the forefront. Um, did you see any parallels in the film? Uh, between what's happening in Guatemala or what's happened in the past, obviously there's some parallel. But what stood out to you that, that reminds you of Canada? Right. Uh, in the first place, I just might mention quickly that I work with Indo Paris, which is a social justice organization based here in, in Ottawa. Um, and we, we have uh, counterparts in Guatemala, so basically, uh, um, yeah, I've been traveling a lot back and forth to Guatemala uh, in the past years, and there's a couple of uh, obviously patterns that you you, you have to be making some parallels to the situation here in Canada. And I think uh, one of the main aspects that I was going to mention, but I think Rachel, you, you totally nailed it. It's about how this movie talked about uh, you know, colonization and how it really entrenched a systemic a system of racism and also um, a very unequal distribution of land leading to, you know, uh, basically, well, the whole movie kind of explained it very clearly. And I think there's definitely uh, some parallels to be drawn with uh, colonization here in, in Canada, obviously. Um, also, but more, uh, I mean, obviously there hasn't been a, a genocide uh, such as, like, a, in a, such a violent way that it has happened in Canada, although some... I'm certain some, that some people might argue that. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, it's true, but, um, but my point was about uh, how impunity um, for um, for crimes of the past in Guatemala is still widespread, and I think it's still the case here in Canada, obviously. And uh, it feeds into the impunity rates um, that we are seeing today, at least at least in Guatemala. Um, I mean, they, uh, we've seen many different cases. So the case of the Spanish Embassy, um, Sepul Sarco, the genocide case. So some advances, obviously, that must be celebrated because of the uh, civil society of Guatemala, which is very strong and as diverse as it, it's, uh, as it is in its indigenous population. But um, I, I think it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, basically uh, important to realize this. And, and I want to touch on a more specific point also, maybe if I have time. Um, I, I'm one of this, the issues that this movie maybe didn't address uh, uh, very uh, directly is the issue of the criminalization of environmental defenders. Uh, which is basically, uh, well, we're also starting, uh, well, not starting, but we've been seeing this happening also in Canada uh, around cases um, of uh, research extraction cases, most of all. So, um, you know, like indigenous communities we have seen in Guatemala are at the forefront of the uh, struggle for the defense of the environment. Uh, Tito, I think you mentioned it also, the, the link with the, you know, the Mother Earth and uh, the respect for, for what's living and non-living. And, 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 you know, during the internal armed conflict, the army or private interests wouldn't wait uh, or wouldn't care very so much about indigenous communities. They would just consider them as obstacles, right? And and you know, uh, commit massacres, force disappearances in order to to implement their projects. And one of those massacres that been mentioned in the movie, the Chisoy Dam, was to build a hydroelectric dam and led to the killing of 400, uh, I think it's Maya Achi uh, people. And uh, so yeah, with the signing of the peace accord, obviously it brought a lot of hope. Uh, people were really um, hopeful, but then it uh, also we've seen the introduction of a very strong neoliberal agenda, and um, I think 
we're also, we can also draw parallels with what's been going on in, in Guatemala here. And, and in Guatemala, the right to free prior and informed consent, al although it's uh, officially recognized by the Guatemalan state, uh, it's clearly not being uh, implemented or recognized at all. And, uh, and communities have been coming up with peaceful means to resist this, uh, such as organizing community uh, uh, consultations. But, uh, but I mean, I could I could go on about this. Maybe I can I can uh, leave it for the moment. But um, we've seen strong militarization and criminalization of defenders, and uh, so I, I'll just leave it at that for the moment. Um, you used a term there that uh, kind of you know, touched on I think a big controversy here is the word genocide, and I know Canada has kind of struggled with that before. I had the opportunity once to ask uh, a former Indian Affairs Minister whether or not he thought genocide actually occurred in Canada. He said no. Um, mm -hmm. Others might say yes. Tito, what do you think? You, you've been living in Canada, you've mentioned for a few years now. Um, so, do you believe a genocide happened here? I would say I'm so honored in this case, you know, it's not just to be in the Algonquin territory, but uh, to have the opportunity to meet my grandfather with a command. And mm. when you listen, very clear, you know, the words of the, the elders locally. You see how many cycles of oppression they have survived. Uh, sometimes we talk about what happened in the third world, where the Maya is part of the third world. But what happened here in the, the local reserves? In Kasachi, and then, there are many names. You know. And I have been there in several conditions, in one of the you know, richest countries. There is a lot of work we, need, we still need to do here in Canada. And I think the genocide, uh, if you take it in the Western academic term, you know, there are many discussions, and it's like democracy, you know, there are so many takes on that on the term. The reality is that people have been enslaved, have been enslaved, have been punished, they have been bought and sell, sold, you know, there have been a lot of suffering. Of course. Where there is a colonial society has dominated another sector of, 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 the, of the society, normally there have been genocide, not just uh, here or in Guatemala, in many parts of the, of, of the world. And this is what we need, not just to recognize, but to reconcile ourselves with our own patterns of education, culture, and history. And then to make all the efforts for that not to happen anymore. And that, that's the connection. I think that the, this is what this film can bring to the Canadian audience. That happened in Guatemala. But in some cases, Canadian mining companies are perpetuating this, the, the story. We need to stop that. It doesn't mean that uh, to be Canadian is something bad. No, it, it took me a long time just to become Canadian. I think it's a, a big responsibility. But genocide is something that we need to address in every single part of the world. Do you believe there's something here that indigenous Canadians can learn, or, or vice versa? Yes, exactly. When you see, you know, how even alcohol was used as a weapon at a certain time of history, once you use something like that as a weapon, genocide exists. And then we need to learn that weapons can be different in different parts of the world. Like I said, alcohol is part of our culture like that in Central America because it's a tropical country but cannot be used as a weapon necessarily, but other kind of, of things can be used as a weapon. And this is the thing, is how the Canadian population can, we can learn about what is happening in other parts of the world, how we can get involved, and how we can just develop this kind of um, leadership worldwide about peace, about engaging in solving the problem. It's not just identifying the problem. But uh, of course, in this case, I think that my claim would be that we should be stopped. That we need to stop to be involved in war in any part of the world. Any Canadian bomb is going to kill civilians. And we can use those resources for education, for health, for training for Pacific <coughs> technology. And this is the, the this is the thing that we need to discuss more. And I think that this film basically opened the door in some ways 
for us to discuss what is happening there and what is has been happening here. What we need to talk more about the murder and missing indigenous women locally. And what does pattern of culture happen? Why an indigenous person can be shot so easily without people making uh, many male comments in Wiete? In the same situation south of the border with the black population. How a kid, one a young, how a young girl can feel part of the society if they don't have access to the same resources, if they are treated in many cases without their proper dignity. Hmm? Uh, Rachel, do you believe that Canadians are turning a blind eye to some of the problems here and perhaps risking um, violence and, and the type of situation that's happened there here in Canada? I don't think Canadians willfully turn a blind eye. I think I think it's a matter of really um, education and for Canadians coming to know the role that they are um, directly or indirectly playing in a country like Guatemala. As as has been mentioned here, really we went from um, one, I mean with the United Fruit Company, which was talked about in the film, really you could now substitute Canadian mining companies in Guatemala and the same story could be told, you know, just update the pictures. Uh, and unfortunately, when I, I think that most Canadians don't understand that story. Uh, and it's a story that groups like Mining Watch and Interparis are doing such powerful work to tell and to educate Canadians about. And I honestly believe that once Canadians, and I mean it, all Canadians, not just corporate Canadians, understand better, we can start to take steps together. To, to be better um, global citizens in places like Guatemala. I think it's really essential, uh, and, it, and I think we, we will get there. But it, it, I mean, if you, in terms of the parallels between Canada and Guatemala, you know, we live in a country where children in Canada, Aboriginal children, First Nation children, um, there's about 60 cents spent on them to every dollar that's spent on a non-Aboriginal child to access health, education. You could say a similar story about Indigenous children. It's a worse story, but it's a similar story, or not even worse, I meant in terms of the dollar values, um, in Guatemala. I mean, the fact of the matter is, Indigenous people do not have the same access to health care and to services. They are discriminated actively against in many contexts. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, in both countries, and what I think is really powerful is indigenous activism in both countries, and that's what needs to be supported. We need to support that activism. That's another way Canadians can help, besides taking on the role to curb their, our own companies and force those companies to be res responsible citizens. We need to also really support civil society in both countries. It's criminalization here as well, right? We criminalize some of the same resistance here. Um, I do want to turn it to the audience at some point. Um, it, it was really enlightening to me to, to read the Aranda by Joseph Boyden, mm -hmm. who really um, described the warping of the, of the relationships that were, that were um, indigenous here uh, through the influence of the Europeans coming to, to North America. It's just, it, it, it's quite... Um, heart wrenching um, and 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 uh, and native uh, communities uh, behave very differently. Um, I mean, massacres might have happened, but it was um, that 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 wouldn't have happened otherwise. It was just the colonial interest that that prodded this warping. Uh, relationships. Uh, basically, I would like to say it's, it's a relation, genocide is a relation of power. And that's why I don't want to idealize my own Maya culture. They were very, you know, great people, but they were wrongdoers in that culture. And that's, that's so important, you know, even we don't have to, 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 to use the color of our skin to define a political situation. Genocide is a political situation. It involves the different layers. Sometimes well, a lot of people consider when you have a policy to disperse them. Exactly. Um, the uh, ethnic, the specific the ethnic. residential schools was a good example of that here in Canada, where the government decided we're going to take kids 
from your community against your parents' will and put them into school for 10 months of the year, um, and depending on your definition of genocide, um, many would believe that does fit the definition. And that's why we can just include all definitions, but make genocide a, a word that is not going to happen anymore. Doesn't matter the, the, the context of the definition, let's stop genocide in those all its forms. So, one last question here, Guillaume. Um, what do you walk away with after watching the film? What have you learned? Well, first of all, I learned that Rudy Gobert Taminchu was involved in a lot more things. That, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, she seems to be really, really active. Uh, what I learned, um, well, I think it's, uh, it's easy, I guess, to, uh, when you work you know, in that field, international development, international cooperation and solidarity with, uh, with people in, in Guatemala, in this case, on a regular basis, it's easy to, uh, I guess, forget like, how you know, like the, the weight of history uh, is, is very strong. It's, it's there, it's, uh, it's on a daily basis. People live it in their, in their reality. And, uh, and you know, having like, those kind of like, moments where you stop and you kind of like, take a look back, and I think this movie made a great job at this kind of like, you know, starting from the colonization and remembering all of what happened, and just kind of like to, uh, yeah, to, to to put yourself back in the shoes of, of the people that you're working with, and, and seeing also where the, so the, the root causes basically of, of systemic injustices and, and uh, situations that we're, that we're seeing in Guatemala with impunity. And so uh, yeah, I think it, it's uh, it's a good reminder, and it uh, for me it kind of like gives me a bit of more drive to you know keep on going. Uh, forward and, and sending in solidarity with the with the people that we're working with. So, yeah. I think we may have time for one more question from the audience. I'm not sure if anybody else. One more question, someone. In. Looks like over here beside the camera. <laughs> it's more of a comment. Um, I just wanted to be in support of the importance of solidarity and um, as a as a youth. Uh, I personally realized how important it is to build that relationship between indigenous and non-indigenous around the world. It does not have to be here, it doesn't have to be Guatemala. I personally experienced uncovering mass graves in Guatemala. I was in Uba and I was in Quiche. And it was from there that I realized how much I need it for me to, to build within our own truth and reconciliation here. Because we have to learn from one another. Um, around the world because, you know, the Truth and Reconciliation happened in 96 in Guatemala and we're just starting it and I've been there and it's not better. I've been into the, I've been into the forensic labs in Guatemala, there's femicide. You talk about missing emerging indigenous women, that's just the tip of the iceberg what it is here in Canada. Thousands of women get murdered on a daily basis in a month in Guatemala. So we need to learn, we need to embrace ourselves, non-Indigenous and Indigenous need to work together. Because what holds us back is discrimination and racism and, and stereotypes. We talk about that in, in small parts in Guatemala, it's the same. And we can never move forward unless non-Indigenous support Indigenous work. So that's all I have to say. <laughs>